Good morning, everyone. Gosh, that sounds awfully strange to say to an audience full of developers. It seems like before about 10 a.m., everyone exists in some kind of quantum state. Uh, you know, I, I didn't actually realize that uh, developers showed up to things this early in the morning. So, so welcome, everyone. And uh, you know, now that we're back in person, um, it's uh, actually a little bit great for speakers because uh, everyone has to keep their camera on and can't disappear halfway through the meeting. So uh, excited to have you trapped in this lovely captive audience. So welcome to my talk. All right, you think that the world is a beautiful place. The sun is shining, the trees are growing, the flowers are blossoming, the children are playing, and your source code does exactly what you think it does. Well, I'm here to tell you that you are wrong, it is raining, the trees are being cut down, the bees are missing, the children are all on TikTok, and oh yeah, your source code may contain malware that you cannot see. So welcome to my talk. <laughs> all right, everyone meet Jerry. He's a nice guy. He plays tennis, he likes ice cream, he's the favorite child of his family, he's a part-time doomsday prepper. Oh, and he maintains some projects on GitHub. Yeah, good, good job, Jerry. What Jerry doesn't know is that he's about to cause the largest cybersecurity incident of the year. Why? Because Jerry's human. He's not a robot. He's not a billionaire. He's not a billionaire robot. <laughs> he's just Jerry, and he's vulnerable to attacks that he can't detect. So let's talk about invisible attacks. Humans communicate in a lot of ways. There's verbal communication, there's sign language, there's smoke signals, and then there's writing. Uh, in fact, I imagine one or two people in this audience may actually be old enough to remember a bygone era when people used this primitive tool, I, I believe it was called a pen, uh, to write things down using these little hand gestures. And, and get this, they actually wrote things down on dead trees, which they presumably cut down to assert their dominance over nature or something like that. I don't know, history is pretty crazy. Uh, but then we get to this civilized era where we have these things called computers. And at this point, someone had to figure out how to represent good old-fashioned writing in some kind of digital format. And not everyone agreed how this should be done. Uh, one of the more popular methods for encoding text was known as ASCII, uh, but it could only capture Latin characters. And uh, of course, there's, there's no issue with that, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the whole of human language can be represented using just basic Latin characters. Das ist gut, ja? Yeah? <laughs> okay, so, so maybe not. Uh, I asked around, and it turns out that some people speak languages other than English. Go, go figure, right? <laughs> this meant that lots of different text encoding standards developed. And if you've ever opened a file using the wrong text encoding, you know that it always produces some kind of dark magic spell that seems to summon Cthulhu from the depths of the Mariana Trench that wreaks havoc across your computer. So to fight off this evil, the world's greatest scientists came together and created a single unified text specification that aims to be capable of representing all of the world's languages. It's called Unicode, and these days almost all digital text is represented using this specification. Pretty much everything from email to Twitter to angry YouTube comments to source code uh, is all Unicode under the hood. Here is an interesting feature of human writing. Our species doesn't seem to agree on the direction that text should be written. If you are a writer of English or German, you write text left to right. If you are a writer of Hebrew or Arabic, you write text right to left. Since Unicode aims to represent all of the world's languages, this means that it must capture both directions of writing. It also means that it must have a deterministic mechanism to combine text from different directionalities. For Unicode, this is called the bidirectional algorithm, and it's about to become your worst enemy. So let's take a tour of the bidirectional algorithm. Each character has a natural directionality associated with it. This allows English to default to left to right, and Arabic to default to right to left. 
But when text of different directionality is mixed, characters are combined using some sensible default that is overall pretty complicated. Uh, sometimes, though, this default ordering might not be desired. And to support the set, this, uh, a set of directionality control characters were created by Unicode. Uh, and this allows fine-grained control over text directionality. So let's consider an example. We start with the text A, B, C and this text naturally displays as left to right. Uh, then we add control characters, which override the directionality to right to left, and uh, resets back after the text is done. Uh, the text now reads as C, B, A, despite the underlying logically encoded order still being A, B, C. So, Things get much more complicated than this, though, when we realize that directionality control characters can be nested within each other. So, welcome to the multiverse of madness. Here's another example. This time, we have the text A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, we place two separate left to right control sequences around A, B, C, and D, E, F, respectively. Thus far, there is uh, no change to how uh, the text is displayed until we add in these, these characters uh, and we, we wrap the entire sequence in a right to left environment. So, so what happens now? The text displays as D, E, F, A, B, C. Uh, and let's actually put some little boxes around the different segments of, uh, of text here so that you can see what's going on. Uh, you see, the ability to nest directionality control characters allows fine-grained control over character display order despite the logically encoded order of text. And hopefully this example will show, um, even in some of the more simple cases, that uh, you can actually achieve some very fine-grained display orders or reorderings of, of text. Okay, so what could go wrong? This all seems fine, right? It's, it's just text. Uh, all I've shown is that we can create deterministic, complex differences between the logically encoded order and the visually displayed order of, of text. All right, so at this time, please fasten your seatbelts, raise your tray tables to the upright and locked position, and anticipate the cacophony of crying babies as we begin our descent down into the rabbit hole. All right, so remember all of those references to source code a few minutes ago? Since most source code is written in Unicode these days, this means that source code supports all of these nifty bi-directional features. Cool, except wait a minute. For source code to do anything interesting, it needs to be run through some sort of compiler. But the thing is, those compilers don't care about the display order of text. They ingest the raw bytes of source code. And this means that they process the logically encoded order of text. So where could we be going with this? So uh, Dr. Evil over here has been thinking, and he thinks that he can use this for some nefarious purposes. Uh, what if he were able to inject some of these directionality control characters into source code such that the code appeared differently to humans and to compilers? He's sure he could find a way to do some kind of evil with that, uh, but uh-oh, how is he supposed to inject these control characters arbitrarily into source code? Those characters would presumably break the syntax of the language and, and cause some kind of compiler error, right? Oh, it seems like we're saved. Like, Arya Stark to the god of death, not today. Or wait. But then Dr. Evil thinks some more and realizes that virtually all programming languages will let you put arbitrary Unicode anywhere in your code. You, you may have actually heard of this feature before. It's called a comment. I'm sure that we're all intimately familiar with comments and code because everyone here definitely takes the time to document every line of code that they write. And it turns out that there is another way that you can inject arbitrary Unicode into your source code, and that's string literals. Uh, in most languages, you can put just about anything you want between double quotes. So let's recap. Humans can't agree which direction text should be written. So we designed computers that support both left to right and right to left text. We implement this in a specification called Unicode, which gives us special control characters that allow fine-grained control over the display order of text. Uh, 
And it turns out that compilers ignore the display order of text. Uh, and this allows us to uh, smuggle these directionality control characters uh, into our source code uh, where we can place them into comments and strings. So great, once again, what's the problem with this? Well, here's the thing. This Dr. Evil, he's, he's a pretty clever guy. And he realizes that he can use directionality control characters in comments and strings to visually reorder source code uh, such that the tokens present different semantically correct logic to humans and to compilers. Okay, that, that, that's a big deal. Let's state that again. Syntactically valid control characters in comments and strings can visually reorder the surrounding text to look like syntactically valid code that's not actually there. This means that you can encode source code so that it looks like it says one thing to humans, but actually says something different entirely to compilers. So let's look at an example. And since we are now talking about attacks, let's switch this presentation to dark mode so we let the world know that we are indeed hackers. Okay, so consider the following program in C. Uh, its behavior appears to be straightforward. It begins by setting the Boolean variable isAdmin to false. It then checks whether this variable is true, and if it is, it prints that you are an admin. We would expect that this program wouldn't do anything, so let's run it in C. Huh, okay, well, that's strange. Uh, it seems to say that we are an admin. Let's, let's see what's going on here. Uh, looking at the underlying encoding, uh, which I have helped to visualize on the, on the screen here, uh, the line of code with the if statement has actually been reordered using directionality override characters. Let's, let's zoom in on that line. It, it's still a bit tough to see what's going on here, so uh, I'm going to turn on an animation that alternates between what a human sees and what a compiler sees. And now the issue becomes clearer. If a human sees an if statement, this compiler is, is actually just seeing a comment. This is a toy example, but you could imagine that an if statement uh, might gate something significantly more substantial, like, for example, administrative controls over a power grid. You know, we've, we found ways to encode source code such that it looks innocuous to humans, but it does something potentially evil in the eyes of a compiler. And it turns out that there's lots of ways that this can be exploited. Using directionality control characters, we can effectively anagram some adversarial program A onto some benign looking program B. And we call this the Trojan source attack. And by the way, if you weren't already angry at the world, let me just call to your attention that Trojan source attacks persist through copy and paste. That means that if someone posts a code example on a forum somewhere online that contains an invisible attack at the encoding level, this attack will still be there when you copy and paste this example into your code base. But of course, no one here would ever do that, so uh, let's, not, let's not dwell on this point. Okay, so let's go back to Jerry. Y you remember this guy from the beginning of the talk? Well, he's been busy cleaning out his doomsday shelter, so he didn't catch anything in this talk thus far. And, uh, you know, when he's not busy preparing for the end of days, Jerry maintains this uh, random little project on GitHub. Uh, it's something pretty boring. Let's say that it's an XML parsing library. And it just so happens to be the most popular XML parsing library across the ecosystem because that's how the internet seems to work, right? Well, uh, perhaps some of you have seen this informative infographic before, which describes how bulletproof our modern software supply chain is. I, I think it's a, a great example of uh, the, the lovely state of cybersecurity in 2022. So one random Tuesday morning, not unlike today, Dr. Evil makes a pull request against Jerry's GitHub repo. It includes what appears to be some optimizations to code that will make it run better or something like that. So Jerry takes a look through and he's happy to merge it into the main branch. And this change is of course automatically pushed out to a whole bunch of different package managers. And over the coming days, all of the downstream projects that use this library update to use this latest version of the code. 
Uh, and uh, before you know it, this code is deployed in some online widgets, a couple of e-commerce sites, uh, a major operating system or two, uh, and uh, of course the critical infrastructure that powers that electrical grid that we were talking about a few minutes ago. And if you hadn't guessed by now, Dr. Evil had used the Trojan source attack to encode uh, an invisible vulnerability uh, into this code uh, that was merged into Jerry's open source XML parsing library. It introduced some behavior that, upon seeing XML of a certain format, caused it to execute whatever was contained inside that XML. Uh-oh, so Dr. Evil can now use this uh, to remotely take over any machines that are running code that somehow consumes Jerry's XML parsing library. And the best part of all of this is that any human looking at the source code for the Jerry's project won't see anything unusual because the vulnerabilities are hiding at the encoding level when be, uh, instead of being visible as standard text like we would typically imagine in a source code. So that's the Trojan source vulnerability. Uh, but there are a few other ways that we could use Unicode tricks to wreak havoc on the world. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise at this point, right? So let's talk about machine learning. It's the future of code, right? The next generation software systems will contain increasing reliability on machine learning models that perform increasingly complicated tasks. Unlike source code, machine learning models are represented by numerical weights that are assigned to nodes in complex networks. And these are the same networks that we like to post pictures of on social media when we want people to think that we're smart. So machine learning models must be inherently safe from Unicode-based attacks because this is something totally different, right? I mean, how is machine learning related to text and, and Unicode? Okay, so if you believed that, then you clearly haven't figured out the pattern of this talk. Uh, the doors are in the back, you can see yourself out, you can join Jerry at the bar, and I imagine we'll bring a ding a bell or something before we get on with the next talk. Uh, but for everyone else, you've realized that you've been living in the matrix this entire time. You suspect that nothing has meaning anymore and you're bracing yourself to see what other mission critical technical systems are about to fall apart. So let's talk about adversarial examples. If you're the sort of person that's interested in machine learning, you've probably seen this picture before. If not, that's okay. What you see on the left is an image of a panda. Uh, and when we put that image through a machine learning model that's supposed to do some computer vision and tell us what's in the image, we see that the model tells us we are indeed looking at a panda. However, when we add a tiny little bit of invisible noise to that picture, all of a sudden, the model thinks that we're looking at a gibbon. Uh, this is the classical case of an adversarial example in machine learning. And adversarial examples are, are basically just inputs to machine learning models that look normal to humans, but make machine learning models output incorrect results. This particular example seems mostly harmless, uh, unless, of course, you happen to be a cuddly panda living in a world full of, I don't know, killer robots that are programmed to attack gibbons. Uh, in that case, your life probably sucks right now. But uh, I promise that things are about to get much, much worse than this. So traditionally, adversarial examples have been focused on images. This makes sense. It's actually quite easy to make subtle changes in pixel values uh, in images that are too small to be detected by humans. Things become much harder when we're talking about text, though. Researchers have tried various techniques to generate adversarial examples in the textual domain, uh, but the issue is that text is just much more discrete than images. That is to say that it's really hard to make small changes and any changes that you make are likely going to be quite visible to humans. So some techniques that researchers have tried in the past include misspelling words on purpose or paraphrasing sentences to put words into a different order. But, you know, these just are largely less compelling uh, techniques because the changes that you make are going to be visible to humans. So here's where we get back to our Unicode tricks. 
earlier, we decided that we could uh, change the directionality of text such that the logical and visual order of characters were different. Uh, we were effectively reordering the characters on the screen. Now, in the Trojan source attack, we started with a desired logical ordering and then modified the visual ordering to suit our purposes. So now let's do the exact opposite. Let's start with a fixed display order for characters and then modify the underlying logically encoded order. So uh, recall the example earlier in which we caused the logically encoded string ABC to be displayed as CBA. Uh, now let's do the same thing, but let's reverse the characters in the logical encoding to exactly offset the changes in the display order. This means that the text is now encoded as CBA, but it displays as ABC. So what's the issue here? Well, we've just demonstrated that we can make invisible changes to text. And guess what? Machine learning models get extremely confused in the presence of text that is reordered at the encoding level. Now, why would anyone want to do this? Let's go back to our uh, good friend here, Dr. Evil, who I presume is currently sitting in prison for his Trojan source attacks launched against the XML parser supply chain. Uh, but, you know, these days, Dr. Evil spends most of his time on social media, and he's pretty angry at the world. And he oftentimes tries to post some pretty nasty stuff online. You know, hate speech, disinformation, calls to violence, all of this kind of stuff. So fortunately, lots of places on the internet have hate speech detection that attempts to block things that are highly inappropriate or might incite violence. The bad news is almost all of these toxic content detection mechanisms are powered by machine learning. And it turns out that all Dr. Evil has to do is encode his hate speech using some logical reorderings and he'll all of a sudden be able to get past an undefected toxic content model about 100% of the time. So social media, video comments, blog posts, Dr. Evil and any other person who has come across this research can now effectively evade any kind of toxic content detection. And it turns out that logically reordering text with bidirectional control characters is just one of multiple ways to break machine learning models. You can also inject invisible characters into the text, uh, which have no effect on the surrounding text, uh, but does indeed change the underlying encoding. Or if you'd prefer, you can swap out characters with homoglyphs, which are characters that look exactly the same, but have different encoded representations. And if you don't like that, you can take a really basic approach and just throw whatever garbage you want into some arbitrary text and then inject some backspace control characters that will just remove that garbage when the text is displayed. So the bottom line is that there's lots of ways to use Unicode to break the logical encoding of text without changing the way that that text looks. And using these uncommon encoded representations typically causes machine learning models to fail. So let's just put that very simply. Unicode breaks machine learning. Okay, so at this point, we've now covered two distinct attacks against wildly different systems. Both of these vulnerability patterns affect more than one company. Uh, in fact, they both happen to affect the entire industry. So what do you do when you find broad vulnerabilities? Well, uh, one approach is just to release this information uh, about these attacks directly out into the wild. Uh, and. Uh, you know, this is uh, kind of like asking uh, all of the different tech companies of the world to play the squid game. And uh, spoiler alert, it doesn't end well for most people. And this is because vulnerabilities released directly into the wild are effectively zero days. Uh, and this means that no tech organizations have time to release patches that are going to protect users from these sorts of attacks. So the much more responsible approach is to conduct a coordinated disclosure. And in coordinated disclosures, researchers send descriptions of otherwise unreleased vulnerabilities to affected software vendors uh, under the terms of an embargo. And this gives those companies time to fix these vulnerabilities before they're made public. 
Now, the larger of the two coordinated disclosures uh, that uh, were referenced in this talk was for the Trojan source attack. And after discovering the potential for supply chain attacks using invisible vulnerabilities, we began a 99-day process in which we notified dozens of different companies and organizations about this potential attack vector. You know, it was a bit of an arduous process, but here's some of the, the key lessons that we learned about the coordinated disclosure process. So first, disclosing unique or novel vulnerability patterns is actually really difficult. Most tech organizations are super quick to respond to common attack vectors that they know really well. So these are things like SQL injection or cross-site scripting, if you've come across those vulnerability patterns before. But these same companies can be really hesitant to engage with you if the vulnerability disclosed doesn't look like something that they've seen before. Okay, second, CVEs are very helpful. Uh, CVEs, or Common Vulnerability Exposures, uh, are uh, universal numbers that are assigned to vulnerabilities to remove ambiguity when discussing these attacks and their mitigations across different organizations. So including a CVE number in vulnerability disclosures, it turns out, helps to motivate the recipient to pay attention to what you're talking about. And the funny part about it is, is, here's the thing, CVEs are not very hard to get. The process is super straightforward and it's really well documented online. So if you're doing some kind of disclosure process, you might as well leverage CVEs. Okay, third, when a disclosure is coordinated across many different companies, ask a government to help manage your communications. So it turns out that most governments have a vested interest in ensuring that the computing ecosystem is largely patched uh, against any sort of publicly known vulnerabilities. Uh, this kind of makes sense, right? Uh, and for the Trojan source attacks, uh, we leveraged the CERT Coordination Center, which happens to be a US government academic partnership uh, that provides assistance when managing coordinated disclosures. Uh, and this ends up being really helpful because it turns out that if you're looking to communicate with dozens of different companies and organizations at one time, all of a sudden your entire schedule is eaten up by responding to emails and phone calls and things like that. So if you're doing a large coordinated disclosure, leverage the government for assistance. Finally, Linux maintainers are your friends. Linux-based operating system development teams are basically like Batman. You might not really know who they are, but they seem to work tirelessly to keep you safe, and for some reason they can be invoked at any time to come and save the day. So the issue with the open source ecosystem overall is that there's not always someone to send an embargoed vulnerability disclosure to for open source software. So even some of the largest open source projects, things like the GCC compiler, actually lack a security team that is willing to receive embargoed disclosures. Uh, and it turns out that the Linux ecosystem is really dependent upon most of the large open source projects that you and I are also dependent upon. And well-funded commercial Linux distributions are often really happy uh, to um, receive embargoed disclosures and have their own developers uh, write a patch to someone else's open source project, and then they'll release a pull request in parallel with the expiration of that embargo. Okay, so when we released the Trojan source vulnerability, we actually ended up getting some pretty decent press coverage. Here's just a few examples of some of the articles that popped up. And, you know, this is actually one of the things that helps to motivate uh, different companies and organizations that are otherwise reluctant to go and patch uh, a vulnerability when you, when you put it out there. You know, getting a little bit of attention on the issue uh, really does help the issue to get resolved. So that's a peek behind the curtain at running a large coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And you know, thus far we've talked about things that are pretty bad. If vulnerabilities can be invisible and if machine learning is fundamentally flawed, how do you sleep at night? How can you experience joy? Why shouldn't you go join Jerry by building some doomsday shelter and ridding yourself of the technology that's certain to fail? Well, you know, there are specific things that you can do to protect yourself from these attacks. First, you should know that lots of mainstream developer tools have been updated to detect invisible Trojan source attacks following your coordinated disclosure. 
Uh, but uh, when you use uh, GitHub, for example, you'll now see this large warning banner on the top of the website on any repo that uses bidirectional control characters somewhere inside of source code. Uh, and as an, another example, when you write code in Rust, you'll now see a compiler warning emitted uh, when a potential attack is detected. And there are actually lots of other examples. Here's just a few of them. We have uh, GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab, uh, VS Code, Rust, GCC, uh, among many others that have adopted some form of defense. Trojan source attacks can conveniently be defended at multiple stages in the development pipeline. You could have visual warnings in code editors or repository front ends, for example, but you could also have warnings and errors that are emitted by compilers and interpreters. And you could also have static code analysis run as part of your build system. Uh, the important piece is that you have some check for bidirectional control characters somewhere in your code. And if you're someone who builds developer tools, take this as a call to action. You should add Trojan source detection somewhere inside of your product. But what about the machine learning part of the conversations? Well, it turns out defending against Unicode attacks on machine learning is also possible. And in short, inputs to text-based machine learning pipelines must be properly sanitized in the same way that we've grown accustomed to sanitizing other user inputs, such as uh, things that might be put into a database. Uncommon encodings should be resolved in their more common forms uh, prior to being ingested into machine learning pipelines. So let's go through a, a few key takeaways that I'm hoping that you'll take away from this talk. One, invisible vulnerabilities can be crafted within the encoding of source code. Two, overall, Unicode breaks text-based machine learning. And number three, Defenses exist for both of these issues, and you should use them. If you'd like more information about today's topics, here are links to two different websites, uh, which will provide additional details, uh, as well as the full papers that go into significantly more depths on both of these topics. Uh, these websites also host tools that can be used to craft and detect these vulnerabilities. So with that, Thank you all very much. Once again, welcome to Vox Day Zurich 2022. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your time. So thank you, Nicolas. Um, I knew that when I don't write tests, I cannot sleep at night, right? <laughs> now I have the same feeling, actually, that I will not sleep at night anymore. <laughs> so um, what's next? Are there some questions? I come with the micro. Can you go slide before, please? Yes. You're missing point four now, which is basically don't write comments, right? <laughs> <laughs> so something tells me I'm going to get a lot of angry letters from employers if one of the takeaways from this talk is that you shouldn't use comments in your code. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that we should advocate for that. Uh, you know, it, it, it turns out that uh, if you just look through source code for uh, these sort of control characters, you can mitigate this attack pretty effectively. Now, there's a lot of nuance under the hood about what about legitimate use cases where maybe somebody uh, writes multiple different languages and they want to include those languages in their comments. Um, so you have, to be, you have to be really nuanced about how you go alerting for these issues. But uh, yeah, with the proper defenses, um, I think it's, it's still safe to write comments. <laughs>